Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. You know, a question that I get a lot is how to drill a small diameter deep hole. There's a technique for it. There's a technique that I have for it that has proven to be fairly successful over the years. And when I started thinking about how to convey that particular demonstration, it led me to something which led me to something which led me to the board right here, right now. So I'm going to put something up here that I thought was a, was a good tidbit for you to be aware of. And to see this, it's kind of unbelievable until you, until you really crush the numbers and look at the geometry of what's going on. It's lucky we can drill straight holes at all. So let me grab a marker here and put this up on the board for you. Check this out. Let's say we're using a, I'm going to try to make this round and large enough so that you can see it. Now it's like a potato, right? 250 diameter. Six millimeter, 250 diameter. There's your drill. Your drill starts going in that hole, resulting in <laughs> that is seriously ugly, huh? Well, we're going to do it anyway, so hang in there. A 252 hole. Not unusual, right? A couple thousand bigger. Now, if you look at the potential for a round pin in a round hole to bounce around with these two dimensions, what do you have? Two thousandths worth of total indicator reading, or two thousandths worth of movement. A thousandth either way. Here's your center. Now I'm about to rock your world here, so watch this. This distance from here to here. 250, 252. Symmetrical, let's assume for a moment that they are coaxial. This gap right here is a thousand. This gap right here is also a thousand. Now a 250 drill does not have a round footprint on it until you're at least three times the diameter, give or take, depending on the grind of the drill, into the drill. That's when you have 90 degree contact. Until which time you're relying on edge contact, which greatly reduces the footprint of the inside unit. Let's take that to a, a horrible extreme. Let's look at the inside tangent point right there and strike a line vertical. A 2 right here, to the hole. One thousandth of an inch gap right there. What do you suppose that is? I'll tell you what that is. Almost sixteen thousandths of an inch. Both ways. So the potential for that drill to dance around, a quarter of an inch drill to dance around a thirty-second of an inch until you're about three quarters of an inch deep, that just blows your mind. Now if you get into a smaller diameter drill, it gets even worse because now rigidity comes into play and the drill could even be flexing. Why is this important? Well, this is important for many reasons. To be aware of this 1 thou versus 16 thou potential error depending on mating geometries is especially important in tooling. If you have a milling machine and you're trying to make two plates that go together, one with pins and one with holes, and you're two thousandths off on the center or a thousandth off on the center and it won't fit together, well you use what's called a diamond pin. And this is what the diamond pin does. It addresses this problem right here. Now let me sidestep here for just one second and say when you have fixture plates that are going together, one has the pins in it, one has the holes in it, what are those pins actually doing? Well at any given time you have the two pins, unrelated to the 250 hole, just using the board. One pin controls rotation, right? 
and the other pin controls the angle. So this one here is just dancing all over the place until it gets in line with this one and then it locks in. So do they both have to be round? No, they do not. The pivot point needs to be round. The location pin needs to be round. The angular control pin does not. This is where you would use the diamond pin. Now I'm going to draw that a little bit out of scale, of course, but just to give you the idea, based on the black graphic, the diamond pin would be shaped like this. Just like a diamond. But on the outside edge, you still retain some degree of the radius of the original pin. And that is right here. That is that particular chord of the circle which controls the angle. Boom. Perfect. Now, knowing what you've seen here, the smaller you make that diamond here, the more leeway you're going to have center to center. So if you have an old rattled out machine that can't hold its own no matter what day of the week it is, and you try to make a precision fixture, there's your answer, the diamond. And the diamond works because of what you just saw right there. Let's get that off of there. Draw something different on the inside. Let's make that a square, because basically that's what you have when you're looking at four points of contact. You have a square. I'm going to leave that there because it's very relative to what's going on here. This is where we hit the fast forward, right? Alright. Here comes the square. of contact square inside of circle. As you can see, as the square starts to deteriorate on one of the two possible pairs of corners, this is where this comes into hand. This is where it comes into play. Thousand all the way around, but as these tips go away, or as they're removed for tooling purposes, can see that it doesn't matter how far they go away. After a certain point, it's the sides that work and not the top. So this is real handy to know for tooling purposes. And if you've ever tried to do that on an old worn out machine, two pins, two holes, doesn't always work. Uh, I know you guys are already typing, well slot one of the holes, stop typing. You can do that too. You can make a slot on one side, you can make a round hole on the other does exactly the same thing as a round hole or a round pin and a diamond pin. But it may not give you the reverse ability depending on the design of whatever it is you're designing. So as far as the round and diamond are concerned, that's what's happening. Now let's look at this from the drill aspect. I need five more hands here. small primary edge on the drill or the diameter of the drill. Your cutting edge. Man, I'm drawing a total blank here. There we go, like that. A little bit of heel relief. Here's your drill. As it's cutting, it should be cutting fine, but it still has that 15 thousandths worth of movement potential as it makes contact. Keep that in mind. That being said, let's move on to the good stuff. So you get a little bit of 
of geometry lesson today, you got a little bit of milling philosophy, and you're going to get my philosophy for drilling long, skinny holes with a great deal of success. Now, the one thing that I've seen, and i got to laugh when I see it, because it's an innocent mistake. It's not stupid or ignorant. It's just innocent. You, you don't know, you don't know. If you need to drill a hole that's, let's say, four inches deep, if you can drill it half and half from side to side, then do that. That way it's only a two-inch deep hole. But don't start with a four-inch drill. Just don't do it, because as you apply the pressure, the drill's got an opportunity to bow from the pressure. You may be able to visually see it or not. But as it bows, the tip geometry aims in a different direction. And before you know it, that drill's doing this down inside that hole, and there's no way the two holes are going to meet there. They're just not. I've actually seen guys drill holes where the drill actually blows out the side of the part, inside the chuck or inside the collet. They pull it out and they go, hey, how come I can't see through the hole? Well, it's because it bent and came out the side. Drills are a lot more flexible than you think, and they will bend, they will flex, they will walk. So the most important part of drilling a deep hole is the beginning. You absolutely must pay attention to the very start of that hole. If it's a matter of, of super precision that you need, don't trust the center drill. Pop a small center drill in there and then bore it. You've got to make sure that that initial footprint is running concentric or the rest of the hole is just a crapshoot. It really is. So here's the thought. Lathe, part. We're going to put the chuck over here, collar over here, whatever. We're going to put the part right here. Here's your part sticking out. First and foremost, if you're trying to drill a deep straight hole in a shaft or God knows what, make sure that the part that you're working on, don't assume anything. Check the part. Uh, a lot of times you'll get a piece of material from a bar end that may have a little bit of kick to it before it straightens out. Roll it on a surface plate. Look for it to do the old flip-flop thing as it's going or look for light under it in the center as it's rolling. Make sure the part is straight. That's really important because if you're going to grip it end to end and it's bent, holes they may meet, but it's going to be an apex and it's not going to be a straight hole. Alright, step number one, center drill that hole. Spot drill it, center drill it, I don't care what you do, just start the hole. I personally use center drill pretty much on everything. I use spot drills on a mill, I use center drills on a lathe. Put a hole in here that is close to the size of the hole that you want. Don't go, don't go full guns and say, I'm just going to get knocked this right out of the park. Don't do it. Use a stub drill. Important. Use the shortest drill that you can get away with initially. To drill a deep hole, you don't use one drill. You use several drills. As you get deeper into the hole, you change the drill. Put a little bit longer drill in there and use the amount of flute that you have on that. And then put a longer one in, use the amount of flute that you have on that and then go for the throat with the deep one. Don't start with the deep one first. Have several. Make sure they're sharp. In the beginning, put that undersized hole in here. If you have to bore it at this point, if you need a really small boring bar to make sure that that drill didn't do that high point, low point thing that I just showed you before, dust that hole until your gauge pin fits in it. Now it may be eccentric, it may be, it's not eccentric, but put a lead in here. Make sure that that is running true. The only way to make sure it's a, it's a true hole is to bore it. I don't care how many guys are going to scream and say, oh, I can do it with a reamer. You're never going to get the same concentricity accuracy that you will with a boring bar. It's just, you won't. Because drills and reamers are slaves to the pilot. If it's a wallered out hole and it's going eccentric, when you stick a reamer in there, it's not going to true it up. It's going to follow that ugly hole. It's going to open it up, but it's not going to true it up. The only way to do that is with a boring bar. Okay? So bore a small lead in there. Then take your reamer, the size of the finished hole, and ream that hole. Ream the first half inch or three quarters of an inch, depending on what diameter that you're using. Ream it out. So we have a center drill, a pilot hole, a bore, a dust bore. Doesn't have to be full depth, quarter inch, whatever. Just something that's running true. 
And when that reamer hits it, the reamer is going to follow the true concentric feature formed by the boring bar and it's going to walk in there and it's going to clean this up and it's going to give you the square contact points that you need for your twist drill to locate at the tip and somewhere in the back at 90 degrees. That's what you're looking for. How far into that drill can you get so that the tip of the flutes at the nose of the drill are 90 degrees to the next contact point. Look at that distance on your drill and I think that you'll be shocked at how far apart some of those are. Once you have this concentric relationship, then start with the smaller drill, progressing up through the longer and finally to the ultimate length. Don't push them, be patient, use lubricant, and make sure that uh, you retract the drill and clean the flutes out often. If one flute packs up, that's the flute that says, I'm not going any farther, and the other flute tries to do the work. Drill takes a hard left. You think you had it all going on, but it, it got hot, it got a cold fusion, and boom, just ruined the part. Good way to do it. Uh, stick walk out. I'll pop one in. I'll probably go fast forward on it because it's a, it's a process that you just need to take your time. But the fact that you have a pilot, board pilot, and then a ream guide, and then go with the drill, doesn't hurt. So that's the way I do it, that's the way I've always done it, and it has worked outstanding every time. Keep the reamer handy about every half inch, inch or so, depending on what you're doing. Put the reamer in there, and if you want to check whether or not the hole's walking out, back everything off, clean out the hole, stick a pin in it, and let the machine run on a slow RPM. If the pin's doing this, well, you might as well go get yourself another piece of stock, because it didn't work. Hey, let's do it. Let's check it out. See if we can get lucky today. Let's take a look at the parts we're going to use for the sample. This is a 3 quarter inch diameter slug of 316 stainless. 4 inches long, just over 4 inches long. I will face both ends of this because I'm going to drill this from both sides. I will see how deep I can get it from one side, but let's just start with uh, the fact that we're going to try to do it from both sides. Face it off. Center drill it. Both ends. We're going to go for a 201 through here. That's a number 7 drill, 201. I'm going to take a 191 diameter drill. I'm going to go about 3 quarters of an inch with a 191 diameter drill. I am going to follow that up by boring it to 201. Finish size, guys. 201. Only have to go eh, 300 thou deep. Don't have to go very deep. But make sure this is a very nice fit on the gauge pins. Make sure you have several gauge pins laying around. You want this to be right on size with the pin. Any slop here could affect the whole rest of the show. Take the reamer, finish the reamer to the depth of the pilot hole. You now have a built-in drill guide for the remainder of your drill, or drilling operation. We're going to use three different drills for this. For about the first inch, give or take, I'm going to use a stub drill, high speed. Then I'm going to go to a jobber length, and then I'm going to go to an extended. Do not start with the long one. Work your way up. Just like you're working your way into the part, work your way up in sizes of the drills. These are not that expensive. If you have something that's critical, they're only a few dollars a piece. Go online, find them at one of the local supply houses, and get them before you start the job. You will be glad you did. Now inside I talked about high-rise drills or high-spiral or fast-spiral drills, and this is a perfect example of that. Let's line up the flutes. You can see the one on the right is considerably slower, and by that I mean by the time it comes back around, this one has already come back around in half the distance. So by the time this one comes around twice, this one has come around four times. One, two, three times. So this is much more likely to hold a true diameter, in my opinion. If there's some reason that somebody out there knows the uh, reason that that shouldn't be true, by all means put it in the comment line. But as per the graphic on the board, you can see that by the time this one reaches its 90 degree contact point 
and has four points of contact inside the hole, the distance is a lot shorter than your standard twist drill, which goes a little bit further back, about 50% further back. Plus, it's a flat bottom. All right, let's throw this guy in the machine, face the end off. Chances are there's going to be some voiceover because this is not a fast process. Take your time doing this. And as I will show you, instead of cranking the tailstock in and out 9,000 times, set your carriage as a stop and bump the tailstock up against it. Make sure that underneath the tailstock is clean and there's some oil on the ways and it should just float right along. Let's do it. Okay, first things first. You are going to hear me say, bump the carriage. This is what I'm talking about. Tailstock physically encounters the carriage. Don't slam it against it. Lock it off. Drill. Back off a half a turn on the crank. Back this out to clear the drill. Put the drill back in the hole. Lock it. You know at half a turn it's going to engage. Drill whatever you have to drill. Back off half a turn. Slide in and out. This is really helpful when it's an exceptionally deep hole. If you're in there four inches or so and you have a hundred thou retraction per rotation of your crank, you don't want to crank it 40 times to get the drill in and out every time you peck. This is much easier. When you run out of stroke, re-zero your tailstock, move the entire assembly in until it bumps the bottom of the hole, half a turn up, lock it, start the drill, out. Lather, rinse, and repeat. It's a good technique. It'll save you a lot of time. Okay, make sure the OD of the part is running true. If there's any kind of projection, make sure you check it uh, in two places. Very first thing we're going to do is pop a center drill in there. And I'm real happy that the one side of this center drill was severely worn and the other is not. Watch it start to vibrate just a little bit. It, it's chattering just a little bit. And I'll tell you, from where I was standing, it looked like it was running out a mile. When you know you have a deep hole, it's absolutely critical that you start tight. Start tight and end right. So let's spin the center drill around. I've shortened up on the spindle projection. I've locked it. I'm dragging the lock right now and I'm feeding it incredibly slow. So the center drill is now acting like a boring bar. It's cutting the run out off and it's cutting off the chatter on the bottom of the hole. And believe me, when you encounter this, you'll feel it, you'll hear it. There'll be all kinds of indications that it has happened. Going to take it to just about finished size. Not going to go full 250. It's only a 201 hole. Next thing we're going to do is put the 191 in there. That's a 10 thousandths below or a quarter of a millimeter below the final size hole. Going to go about three quarters of an inch deep or 20 millimeters, give or take. And when you see stainless steel kicking off two chips like that coming out of a high speed drill, you know it's cutting very well. This is running at about 425 RPM, uh, possibly 320 at this point. And I know a lot of you screw machine automatic CNC guys are probably saying, boy, that's way too slow. But when the drill is cutting good, leave it where it is. Don't mess with it. And we're getting a little bit of smoke. The WD-40 that I'm using as a lubricant does work, believe it or not. A lot of people say it doesn't, but the WD-40 does work. And if you have the smoke, then that means you have friction and it's not optimized. It's cutting good, so I'm not going to change anything. And I run this down to the final depth. Clean it out. We're going to put a boring bar in here. We're going to come back and we're going to bore the 201 diameter to about a quarter of an inch deep. Make sure you select the proper size boring bar so everything clears. And bear in mind, we only need to take five thou off of either side of this hole. So just a small dust cut initially. 
I'm going to go about as far as the relief section of the boring bar. There's really no need to go any farther. We'll blow the chips off and I have several gauges handy 199 through 202 and I always start with a couple thou below that way I know that the next cut that I can dial in I can dial in at least as much as the difference between the pin that I selected and the finished size of the hole that gives me some place to start I believe that was a probably a 197 reading And I'm feeding that by hand. Going a couple times in and out. You don't want a spring pass to get a come up and bite you in the butt at this point. And start checking it with the pins that are within the range for the size you're looking for. Shooting for 201. And on this side, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I was a little bit over the 201. The 202 just about stuck in there. And I figured why not. It's close enough that I was... Uh, going to fake my way through it. That would be the 200, 201, and the 202 you can see right there by my index finger, but it went in rock solid, so I'm not going to mess with it. This is where you pull out the reamer. That pilot diameter that you just bored in there is now the guide for the reamer. So the reamer is going to track true regardless of what that 191 hole is doing. That front board pilot is going to keep this reamer tracking straight. Don't get over aggressive with it. Don't drive it in like you're uh, trying to split wood or anything. Just drive it in nice and easy. And I want to say thank you to uh, Stan Zinkowski for giving me this anchor loop. I've been using it for tapping stainless. And I found out that it's quite a, an amazing fluid I believe all industrial supplied it for the bash and I got a couple samples while I was out there so thanks a lot Stan I'm a big fan of Molly D and this isn't nearly as nasty as Molly D but it does hang on to the cutting tools very well so I highly recommend this anchor lube stuff I'm new to the uh, applications for it so if you got something that you use it for by all means put it in the comment line all right, first on-size drill, number 7, 201 diameter. This is a high-speed steel split point, 118 degree uh, stubby, 320 RPM. I know that sounds slow, but when this drill hits that 316 stainless, you're going to know right away whether or not it's cutting. And I'll tell you, the way this thing was puking those chips out of that hole, I just couldn't ask for better. The rapid retract is the whole tail stock moving. I am not dialing back on that. Be careful that you do not run out of flute relief on your drill because the chips will pack up and you're going to get yourself in trouble. I am right marginally at the end of the flute relief on this drill, so it's about time to switch over to a new drill. Very good possibility that I am going to refloat that reamer down in that hole just to get a good feel for whether or not the hole is still tracking straight. When you put that reamer in there, if there is an eccentricity between the drill and the reamer, you're going to feel it when you crank it in. It's going to give you a little tapping feel. You're going to feel it as it's going in. If it's still running concentric, it's going to float straight in and you're not even going to know where you're at. You're just going to hit the bottom of the hole and come right back out. Switching over to the jobber lens drill here. This one's got about two inches of flute, give or take. And as luck would have it, I ended up not using the extended. I did go in from end to end. And we're going to show you the bump the carriage setup right now. Right now I just pulled the carriage back so that I can slide the tailstock up and bump it. Going in with the, the jobber lens drill until I hit the bottom of the hole. I will back that drill off about a half a turn and move the entire tailstock out. This one was cutting so smooth I just didn't have the heart to change anything up so I just kept it going. Chips are flowing, keep it going.
And if you don't have a long stringy chip like that coming off the other side of your drill, at least check the flute and make sure that there are chips in the flute. You do not want the drill cutting only on one side. That is a recipe for it to kick and it's going to walk off and you're going to get a hole that's uh, down inside that part whipping around and you just can't see it. Tell you this stuff, this anchor lube is pretty good on stainless. This is not an infomercial for anchor lube, but I was really impressed. And these tools were ice cold. Quite shocked that they were still cold. Normally when you're pushing a high speed steel tool down through stainless steel, you're going to generate some heat. But I was very impressed and that doesn't happen very often. I have about full length on the flute length of this particular high speed drill, the jobber drill, which is your standard kit drill. When I think I'm about halfway or I've run out of flute relief on that, I'll put the reamer back in and I will float the reamer down to assure that we have a fairly continuous diameter and everything is nice and straight. You may have to watch this several times to realize that the tailstock is actually moving out as I'm setting it. I'm pushing the tailstock back when the drill hits the bottom of the hole. Back in with the reamer. Same speed, 320 RPM. Nice and easy. You can see that the tailstock uh, quill is a little bit snug. It's not locked down, but the, with the black vertical handle, there's a little bit of drag on that. All right, we're about two and a quarter inches deep, 201 diameter, 316 stainless steel. We're going to flip this part over. We're going to do exactly the same thing on the other side, possibly at a little faster frame rate. That is not to bore you to tears. Hang on. All right, guys, we're going to change the camera angle here and see if you can follow along. I am uh, bumping the carriage with the tailstock unlocked. I'm going to move the drill till it just hits the bottom of the hole and watch the tailstock walk back a little bit. Now I'm going to lock it. 
And as I drill, I will pull the whole tailstock out, rebump the carriage, unlock, relock it. You'll notice that I always back off about a half to a quarter turn. And that is so much quicker than cranking it all the way out. Night and day difference. Once you've done that, you'll be really shocked at how much more you're going to enjoy that. And like I said before, that drill is ice cold. I just did that because of that uh, anchor lube. I didn't want it on my fingers. I'm going to pull the tailstock all the way in. The tailstock is not locked. I'm going to run the drill to the bottom of the hole and watch for the tailstock to push back. Okay, now I'm locked. I'm going to bring the carriage up. to. That's now my stop point. So every time I bump into the carriage, I know the drill is shy from the bottom of the hole. If you jam a drill down inside of a spinning part like that, it's going to bite and it's going to blow up and you can kiss your part goodbye. I did use two speed ranges to drill this hole. First side was done at 320. All the center drilling, all the reaming, all the pilot drilling, boring, everything was 320. The second side I did at 425. And I got to tell you that the, the feel of pushing those drills down in that hole was much better at the 320 than it was at the 425. There you go. There's the speed change right there. As I said previously, this is not an operation that you want to rush. This raw footage was about 40 minutes, I guess it was. And that's not all 40 minutes worth of runtime. That's uh, camera angles and such. But 40 minutes total edited down to what you're actually watching now. Doing the same thing with the reamer. Floating the reamer in after the drill joints match. You'll feel the bump. If it's out of whack, you're going to know it. Because it's going to you're going to feel a little clicking feeling going on in that handle. It's going to feel like you're... Uh, ah, it's just going to feel like someone's tapping on that reamer. I'm going to pull back, probably move the carriage up if I had to guess. Nope. Tailstock is unlocked. We're going to hit the bottom of the hole and watch for the... There you go. It's moved back. And we start the drill. Set the carriage stop. Here we go. This is accelerated footage, and I do apologize. You guys would be bored out of your mind if you had to watch this whole thing. I know it was uh, tedious just to film it. But make sure you got enough uh, lubrication underneath your tailstock so it floats on the oil. If you have to lift the nose of the tailstock up and ride it up over the oil that you've put on, just make sure there's no chips or anything on the waves as you do that. Get a nice thick sh uh, sheen of oil underneath of that tailstock, and the thing will literally float back and forth quite well. Now you got to be patient when you start getting the drill in as deep as it is now. It's a solid two inches into this part. Make sure you have a, the chips are coming out. The same thing with the other side. If the chips are only coming out on one flute, check the drill or replace the drill because it's only going to bite you in the end. Make sure that you proceed gently towards the break point because when this drill breaks through it's going to want to grab just as if you were drilling a piece of sheet metal. So keep everything snugged up, take small bites, and genuinely have a pretty good feel for where you are as you proceed deeper into the hole. Make sure you don't run out of flute with your drill. Make sure all your chips can be evacuated comfortably. And I think we're about ready to break through. You can also see the width of the swarf that comes out of there will get thinner as you're breaking through. That's another good indicator that the tip of the drill is breaking through and the body's about ready to go. There you go. We're done. 
That's the moment of truth. When those holes break through, if one hole doesn't line up with the other one, you're going to start cutting on an eccentric on the other side, the, the other lead side, and it's just going to ruin your day when you feel that bumping going on in the handle. And to finish it off, float the reamer back through it. You don't have to go all the way through the part. Go to the parting line, maybe a little bit further, and just pull it back out. Let's take this part out of the collet, flush it out with some alcohol, take it over the bench. We'll see if we can get a light down inside that hole and check it out with some gauge pins. See how we did. Okay, we got four and a half inches of 316 stainless here. And let's see if we can get a lick down that barrel. As with any drilled hole, it's not ream quality. The lead is ream. Let's see what we got. 199 diameter pin. Yep. All day long. Well within spec. 200, 201, 202. 200. Yep. 200 it is. 201. Now this one should go. Love it. Let's give it a little help. I'd say I'm putting about, ooh, maybe two pounds of pressure on that, 201. I'm not pushing it very hard, but I am feeling the center. You can feel where the holes meet, but still, you got to believe a hardened 201 diameter pin. The hole has to be tracking straight in at least two inch increments in order to get that through. You're not going to bend that pin. 202. A little bit right at the very tip. And I can tell you that that's the first bore pass that I did on the first side. So 202 goes in there and just sits in there ever so gently. This side, no bueno. Not happening. There you go. You want to do it? Do it the way I showed you. Try it. Uh, that was real time. I didn't take, well, I can't say I didn't take anything out. I may have. I didn't edit this yet. But... I certainly didn't run that whole thing in real time because you'd sit there and your eyes would bleed waiting for it to happen. But don't forget about the unlocking the entire tailstock, pull the tailstock out, bore the lead for the reamer, ream the hole, and then start the drill. And don't be afraid to ream it as you go. You will have great success. 201, four and eh, 200, thou, four and a quarter inches worth of 316 stainless. Not the most friendly stuff for smaller drills. That's a win. Thanks for watching. All right, well, thank you to everybody that has requested that. And sorry it took so long to get to, but it is a time-consuming process. Take your time. Make sure you have several drills around. Be patient. Lubrication. And that whole carriage-to-tail stock bump thing will save you from wearing out your arm if it's a deep hole. It's just so much easier to unlock the tail stock and just push it back in and just turn it, unlock it. Still a good workout. But you're not going to wear the machine out. You're not going to wear your wrist out doing it. It's something I've been doing for a while. You want to put something soft in between the two so they don't hammer into each other. That's fine. When you run out of stroke on the tail stock, zero it out. Move the carriage up until the drill's just about there. Lock the carriage off. Lather, rinse, and repeat. Hope you enjoyed what you saw. I hope the whole diamond concept for fixturing and the multiple tools for a straight, small hole help you in your shop. And I thank you for watching. Joe Pye, Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. Stay well, be safe. See you again. Bye-bye.